so I am ready to get started. So uh, first off, just kind of want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dave Gothier. Uh, I am a freelance airbrush artist and body painter. I am located in the frozen tundra of Wisconsin, uh, more specifically Nina, uh, which is just a little bit south of Green Bay. Uh, with that said, um, getting back to the body painting, um, what I find is in this area, at least for me, when I do body paint, I end up um, having to travel to do it. So for me, being mobile with it is, is a good thing. Um, the only drawback is, if anybody's familiar with some of these Wisconsin winters, dragging that equipment through the snow gets a little old. Um, so what I do is I have a home studio here, which is where we are coming from today. And I like to keep practicing. I like to keep airbrushing uh, throughout what I call the off season. I do take some time off. Um, I don't really do a lot of body painting here in my home studio just because the, you know, limited space. Um, and once you get a team of people in here, it, it can get a bit crowded. So, um, I guess with that, um, we can get started. So what we are doing today, oh, let me check one real quick thing. Um, I noticed this morning uh, during some test shots that the audio was a bit soft. I'm hoping that that um, has improved. If someone could uh, let me know on that, that would be fantastic. So I will check real quick and let's get started then. So what I'm going to do today is take you through a step-by-step -step process of doing an uh, airbrush illustration on canvas. So to start out, what I did is I, I found the image that we're going to do today. Thanks to the internet, I found this particular image. I thought, hey, that would be great. It'll give us a little lesson in dimension here, some shadowing. It'll be perfect. Uh, so what I did is I started with a 12 by 16 canvas. So when I found my image, I scaled it to the size that I want to paint. I printed out two copies of that. Uh, one I use for a reference copy, and the other one I'm going to use as a mask a little bit later, and we'll, I'll get back to that. Um, so what I'm going to do is take my reference photo here, And I just kind of hang that so I can, you know, refer to that obviously as, as we go. Um, the next step is if anybody has ever airbrushed on a canvas before, the, the canvas has texture. And due to the airbrush using air, what happens is that that overspray gets caught on some of these small fibers and the texture of the canvas. So one way to eliminate that is to prep the canvas. And the way I do that is I take something called gesso and I will prime the canvas. Now this is just a white, basic white acrylic gesso. Um, I will put on a thin coat using a standard paintbrush let that dry real good. I will then go over it with uh, sandpaper. Okay. Um, I use, uh, I think in this case I use 220. Uh, I went over it, it smoothed it out pretty good. I put a second coat on and then this morning I came down and sanded the second coat. And what that does This is my primed canvas now. And what that does is it will remove some of that texture, that canvas texture. So now when we airbrush, we don't really have to worry so much about the overspray catching on the canvas fibers. Um, 
the more coats you put on, the more you sand, you can actually get this canvas to a smooth, perfectly smooth, even illustration board type uh, surface. And it works great. So good thing for us, I did that already. So to start, the first thing that I am going to want to do is paint the background. Now, I don't know if you can see how well you can see this image, but what we're dealing with here looks to me like about three colors. We have black, white, and if you can see, there's a little bit of red in here, okay? Um, past that, it looks pretty straightforward. Uh, what I would like to do though is instead of just painting this image on here I want to have some type of background uh, just to break it up a little bit maybe knock this you know white back a little bit um, nothing too crazy but I just would like to get away from the stark white canvas um, and again if um, anyone has any questions at all excuse me, please feel free to comment. Um, I am doing this uh, by myself today, so I will periodically check questions and answer them uh, the best that I can and as fast as I can. Um, so, first off, I'm going to be doing the background. Now, if you look at this background, I think some of this color, if you will, is coming from the fact that it is just a... a internet image. Um, I'm not going to paint the entire canvas, but I do just kind of want to give it a little, a little something, a little shadowing, a little shading around the outside. I will throw a little bit of texture in it. We're probably going to kind of simulate that it's, it's more of like on a, some type of rock wall maybe. Um, so to get started with that, We will start by using gray. So right now I have two different grays here. I am going to be using a transparent medium gray and a semi-opaque. Now. Theoretically, they would be the same. One is just a little bit darker uh, and goes on a little bit easier, if you will. Um, but the getting back to the paint that I'm using today, actually, um, I will be using a product called Createx. Uh, this is a great, great acrylic paint. You can use it right out of the bottle in your airbrush. Um, I've been using this for a uh, long time. Uh, they do have uh, a number of different um, uh, different paint types, if you will. Um, the standard Createx, uh, a lot of t-shirt artists use it. It's, it's, it's a textile paint. Um, you can actually heat cure it into uh, the material when you're done and it'll last for quite a long time. Um, the other lines that they have are auto air colors. Um, just the color spectrum is is phenomenal. You can get uh, pretty much any color that, that you would need. Um, and then more recently, I have been using the illustration line of colors. Um, this is a very, very unique paint. Um, the more I use it, the more I like it. Um, when you're getting into doing some of these um, illustrations that, that have higher detail, um, what you can do with this is after you paint it on, um, you have about a uh, 25 to 30 minute window where you can take either an X-Acto knife or a small eraser and then you can actually pull that paint off so what you're doing is creating highlights by removing paint so which is where the term subtractive highlights come from so anyway this paint good paint 
As far as the airbrush that I'm using today, um, it's just a Iwata Eclipse. This is the HPCS. This is a gravity feed uh, dual action gun. Uh, for those that aren't overly familiar with airbrushing, uh, dual action means the farther down I push, the more air I get, and the farther back I pull, the more paint I get. Now, in combination with those two controls, I can control how much paint goes down. So, uh, what I will do is uh, check my comments real quick and make sure we are on track and I will be right back and So one question is do you prefer not using an easel? Um, depending on what I'm painting uh, I find that if I use a and who asked that question? Jonna Summers is asking do you prefer not to use an easel? Um Again, it kind of depends on what I'm doing. When I'm painting t-shirts, I do like to use an easel. Um, in this particular case, it, it's more comfortable for me to, to you know, sit at my desk and, <clears throat> um, excuse me, uh, you know, paint here. Um, depending on how long I'm going to be painting, um, sometimes using an easel really doesn't help um, because I end up standing for uh, longer than I care to. Um, so in, today we'll be working at the desk here. And unless anybody has any questions at this time, we will start with the background. That's the questions for now. Okay. Again, I will use the createx and i'm going to start with a medium gray this is a transparent color now i did not um, get too in depth about the airbrush if anybody has tuned into um, Yesterday's class that SIG had done on uh, the Airbrush Bootcamp, uh, just excellent information uh, as far as um, learning control, some uh, different exercises you can do to, um, you know, learn control and kind of master that a little bit. So why don't we get this started? So I have my uh, medium gray loaded up. And I am running at about 30 PSI. And I like to put down paper on my board here because that way I can kind of test the, the flow, make sure the paint's working okay, make sure the airbrush isn't clogged, anything like that. Um, and in this case, it looks like we are off to the races here. So what I'm going to do in looking at this, I, I see it looks to me like there's some shadow here and a little bit up here. So almost as if it were an oval. So what I will do starting on along the edges I'm just going to slowly start building up color. Now using a transparent paint it's going to take a little bit longer. Now I'm slowly putting light layers on top of light layers. Uh, the one thing about airbrush is what you really don't want to do is try to get that final coat in your first couple of passes. Um, rule of thumb for me, uh, the more light coats, the better it's going to turn out. Um, 
and you can see uh, I just kind of had a little hiccup with the airbrush uh, you may or may not be able to see it there's a couple little splatter marks um, honestly at the end of the day it's not really anything to be too upset about um, we can either get creative cover that up somehow or the image itself is probably going to be drawing your eye away from it anyway, so I'm not too overly concerned. Um, that coming from someone who has dripped paint on more paintings. But what that does is it allows the artist to, to get a little more creative. Um, I know, in fact, when I have done uh, body paints in the past where I'll get a paint drip or something and it's not what I wanted well ultimately what it did is it gave me the chance to now I got to think outside the box how can I fix this how do I you know how can I tie this into the design and it all works out at the end of the day so I guess what I'm getting at is if something happens that you weren't expecting don't really worry about it too much it's all gonna be okay so that is pretty much our background um, in looking at it to me it still looks a little bit plain so what I'm going to do is add a little bit of texture to it um, to do that I am going to use a few different uh, texture stencils that I have um, kind of see them these are available at any art supply store if you look um, into airbrush stencils at all um, they work wonderful uh, to build texture and again you can use these for body painting it's not just canvas you know a lot of these techniques and stuff can be used on, on both, both platforms so what I'm gonna do uh, I'm liking the way that this looks uh, it looks a little bit white yet so I'm just gonna go in and kind of dust it uh, just to knock a little bit more of that white down um, I'm not even sure the camera will be able to see that there is much of a difference there. Um, so now I will take my texture stencil. And now I'm going to put on a little bit heavier coat. You can see it just adds a little bit of texture to it. And that is exactly what we're after and all that's going to do is break up that background a little bit um, we're not out to cover the whole thing um, just to create again to create some texture can, when you're done with that can you bring that a little closer to the camera to show them how that texture looks I certainly can Now I'm using a couple different stencils like I showed you, uh, just kind of randomly putting texture in here. There, you know, there really isn't a right or wrong way to do this. Uh, I would recommend that you kind of experiment and, you know, you'll, you'll find what works for you, what, what doesn't work for you, what you like, what you're comfortable with. Um, now I'm going to go in and just kind of fog some of these areas a little bit. And, Okay, so I am at the point now where I created some texture on the background. Now, um, I can go ahead and I, I'm not sure how well you can see this, um, but basically all, all I did was kind of break up that random white. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So. Uh, I am going to uh, work on this just a little bit yet, uh, throw a little bit more texture in, and I will take a quick break and check comments unless any, does anyone have questions at <laughs> so this So right now we're talking just a little bit about it and there was a question that says, do you ever project the image from behind the canvas to trace? So I know right now you're working from that picture above, 
But have you ever used an image that you are projecting behind the canvas? Can you talk about how you um, just put the <coughs> images on? How Excuse you... me. Um, the next step is actually transferring the image, and I can get a little more in-depth right. uh, once we start with that. Um, projecting it from the back is not something uh, that I have done before. Uh, the problem is that the canvas is actually pretty opaque. So once I prepped it then with the gesso, it made it even more opaque. So I'm not quite sure how uh, one would project uh, through the canvas. Uh, there are a few different ways to, um, to transfer images. Uh, I will touch base on that in just a little bit here. As you're doing this, can you speak to the different kinds of paint and how they're used? Because there's a few questions that are speaking, asking about the type of paint, so the difference between using Createx and using ProAir. Uh, ProAir is more designed uh, as a body paint uh, makeup. Uh, it's FDA approved, um, and it's actually made to spray on people's skin, where um, Createx, it is an acrylic paint, um, I have heard of people using that to body paint, and I would not ever, ever, ever use any type of acrylic paint when it comes to body painting. Uh, what that'll do is it'll seal pores, and unless you want your model to become sick or possibly have some kind of reaction, I would not use Createx uh, for body painting. Um, Donna makes an amazing product. Uh, Pro Air. Uh, for me to body paint, I, I wouldn't use anything else. I'd try different products. Um, I always circle back to Pro Air just because uh, for me, I just, I love the results. So. so now I switched to my little bit darker gray. It's just a subtle difference. There isn't much. Um, but it gives us a couple different variations of the gray for the background. All right, so at that point, I am gonna call this background uh, pretty much done uh, to the point that we um, need it for our next step. Um, our next step here then, ironically enough, is transferring the image. So uh, again, like I said earlier, I actually printed this out full size. And I did that because the way I'm going to transfer this image today is by using a piece of graphite paper or carbon paper. Again, you can get this at pretty much any uh, art supply store. Um, you can use it multiple times. I use that on occasion to transfer images when my reference image is going to be the same size as what I'm actually painting. Um, so in this case, what I'm going to do now, right now, this is just air and I'm just kind of drying the canvas off. Now, to transfer the image with the graphite paper, what I'm going to do
take my reference picture. I'm just going to tack it onto my board in position where I would like it. Now, to me, I think that looks pretty good. It doesn't have to be perfectly square. That might just be my OCD flaring up. I'm not sure. But anyway, once we get the image where we want it, I'm going to slide this graphite paper underneath it. At that point, I can just take a ballpoint pen and all I'm going to do is trace around this black shape that makes up the spider's body and legs. However, when I do that, I am going to trace just on the inside or the, the black side. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a little bit in our next step. So, So you said you're just going around the outside am, of the main I portion am, right yes, now. Yes, I am only going around the outside of the black. The actual shape. The actual shape of that particular spider, not Correct. the shadow. Correct. The drop shadows will come in a little bit later. And now I am actually going around this relatively quick. Uh, my lines aren't going to be as accurate as I probably could make them uh, if I did slow down a little bit. Uh, the nice part about that is you'll see in the next step when we cut our mask for this that that, that particular issue uh, isn't really going to be uh, a problem, will not affect the, the end result. Okay, so so at that point now, I'm going to hold this up here. You should be able to see our graphite lines. I'm going to just run my finger along the edges in case you guys can't see. It's hard to tell, but. All right. So now we've transferred our image on. Uh, does anybody have um, questions at this point? Um, there's some additional questions about both cleaning guns as well as when you change colors, how do you clear out the paint that was in there? I figured you could get to that when you change colors. Yep. Um, and uh, think... Yeah, we couldn't see the lines. Yeah, they're 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 super light lines, and they are um, like in a light blue. Remember that. Unfortunately, you probably can't see them over the over the. I guess I'll call this a broadcast. You won't be able to see them, but you know if you were doing this up close, um, you could see it yourself. The idea is that they're dark enough to be seen and followed but light enough that they are not going to disturb what you're trying to create and be prominent. Correct. Uh, I will give it one more shot here. Um, yeah, there we go. Can you hold that there? So can you guys see these lines up in here? Take a look, follow my, follow my finger and see if, can you see them going out this way? There we go. 
All Did right. that help everybody taking a look for those? Okay, right. they're, they're, they were able to see them, it sounds like. So, a okay. little bit better idea there. So Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so our next step is to... Uh, this is uh, what is called frisket film. And this is a stencil material. What it is, it's a clear material that has an adhesive back to it. So what I am going to do is take this sheet and I am just going to lay it over the top of the image here. So if you all can see that, this is just kind of a semi-transparent film. And what I'm going to do is just lay it down. And all I want to do with this is cover the graphite lines. Why don't you bring that back up again and see if we can see the lines through it. So again, the film is over it, but there are lines underneath here. And again, I'm just running my finger along them. It's very difficult to see because they're super light blue. All right. Now, if anyone has used frisket film before, um, it's a pretty forgiving material. I do like it. Um, the, the one trick to using it, though, is by all means make sure that you have a sharp exacto blade when you're cutting it so now our next step is to cut out the image that we just traced on and i don't use anything fancy just a uh, standard number 11 blades uh, make sure they're sharp uh, the one trick is you want to cut through the film but you don't want to cut into the canvas so i am going to to try to save time here i will start cutting this and um, try to do this as as quickly as possible. And all I am doing is cutting around the blue lines that we put on in our last step. Now, there's multiple ways to transfer an image. Um, there are projectors out there. There are, uh, we use transfer paper. Um, as a matter of fact, this frisket film being transparent, I also could have um, traced the image onto the frisket film. Uh, I didn't get into the different types of frisket film too much. This particular stuff we're using today is low tack matte. And the reason I like to use matte is because it does accept pen. So ideally what I could have done is traced that image of the spider onto the frisket paper and then just laid my frisket film down. Uh, the problem with that is when you put your image down then you need to make sure that it's right where you want it. Um, by doing it this way, I was able to, I could move the paper around before I traced my image and put it exactly where I wanted it. So there's no, um, there's no discrepancy where, you know, where your image is going to go. Anybody has so there's any... another question that says could you use a Cricut cutter for the image versus hand cutting? Yes, absolutely Yes, as a matter of fact um, And one thing I thought of is I actually use a vinyl cutter as well to make stencils um, You certainly can do that Not a problem. Uh, I was actually thinking about doing that today for this class. However, um, going that route kind of opens up a couple different cans of worms because then 
you have um, the, now you're dealing with uh, vector art, computer art, um, you know, things like that. So I just I kind of wanted to keep it more so um, using the pretty common materials. But yes, to answer your question, you can absolutely use uh, vinyl uh, to mask anything off. That's usually never a problem. Um, I do use it on occasion, and I have had very good results with it. So this is definitely part of that labor intensive process where you're taking your time to be diligent and following those lines that you made with your original trays. Yes. yes. And also what this allows me to do is it doesn't really matter how um, possibly shaky my original lines were uh, when I uh, when you traced, traced it. it. Yeah. Uh, because now when I'm going over this with this exacto blade, it's giving me a nice straight um, nice straight line because I can see the image underneath it if there's any uh, mistakes or anything I want to adjust from the lines that I put down I can actually just compensate for it in this stage here while I'm cutting out the stencil So, um, the one nice thing about frisket film is that it doesn't stretch a whole lot. This stuff is actually very forgiving. So now what I'm going to do is carefully peel off the area that I just cut. So yeah, there's a there's a different comment, and one of the things I was calling out from that is um, the discussion is that the frisket film is probably more accessible and uh, maybe even from a standpoint of cost, more easily usable than having a vinyl cutter. Is that fair to um, say? Yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly um, cost involved when you start using vinyl, um, not just the, you know, the initial cost of the, the cutter and everything, uh, but you need vinyl, transfer paper, things like that. And then you're going to spend time um, kind of um, working more on computer art, if you will. I mean, if, if you have a comfort level with computer graphics and you don't have a problem, you know, creating vector art for the vinyl cutter, then, you know, it, it does, it really does work great. Um, and, and again, I'm not out to say that, you know, one is better than the other. Um, I just kind of wanted to show everybody that this is how I do it. This is what works for me. But this isn't necessarily the only way to do it. Can everybody see the actual spider now as it's cut out there we go when you shine it you can kind of see the outline that has been gone on okay now our next step now is to paint the black of the spider 
So is black a different color than what you were doing before? Yes, I currently do have some gray in here yet. Um, what I will do, just empty this out quick. Would you clean it between uh, gray and black? In between colors, what I do is I just flush some water through and kind of clean out the uh, first color that was in there. Uh, that's what I do like about the gravity feed brushes. Uh, it makes color changes uh, pretty quick, pretty simple. Um, Don't talk at the same time. What's that? It's hard to hear you talk and do that. Uh, just using straight water. So I just ran a little bit of water through there and so in our reference picture if you had noticed I know it's up on the wall here but there's a little bit of red in the abdomen there so what we are going to do is just make a little bit of red there And again, you get some residual color left over from what was originally in there. Um, you can tell that originally it was pretty dark. Which is why you have that paper down yeah, to start which with. Which is why I, I, if you noticed, I almost started on the canvas and then switched over to here. Um, so all I'm going to do is create that little red area. Uh, I'm just going to do that real quick. This is actually going to be relatively subdued by the time we're done. So. Um, Give it a nice deep red color. And again with light coats, the more coats you put on, the more intense your color is going to get, the darker your color is going to get. So that's about it for the red. Now due to time constraints, I'm actually, what, what you could do is, you know, make a design in there. You could, um, you know, put the little hourglass, uh, you know, Black Widow look uh, in there. Uh, any number of things. But uh, in the course of time today, we will be um, just making it pretty much close to the reference picture. So. It looks like I've been chatting for a while now. We're going on. We're at 1245 Central. So we got about 15 minutes left. Okay. All right, so next up I'm going to take black. And I am going to paint the rest of the, the body of the spider. Uh, here we go. Uh, the one thing is, if you notice, my, my frisket film doesn't cover the entire canvas. So one little trick to stop overspray is to just take painter's tape or any kind of masking tape and fold it in half. What that little lip is going to do is it's going to catch that overspray. So the nice part about that is you can kind of quickly mask off an area without having to cover the entire surface. Uh, just one little trick I picked up over the years. Uh, seems to work pretty good. It works also very well if you're working on, like if it's a more intense illustration and you're working on a small area, you can mask that particular area out and not have to um, worry about you know, compromising the, the artwork that's around it. Does anybody have any questions at this time? Mm, doesn't 
seem like any additional questions right now. Alrighty. So there we have. If you have any additional questions, don't forget to put them in the feed and I will um, make sure I can make sure Dave knows those and can answer those for you. All right, so next up our color black. I am kind of moving along pretty, pretty quick here. That was not black. <laughs> if, if you ever mix a custom color, Make sure you write that color on the outside <laughs> of the bottle. <laughs> so there we go. Lesson learned. All right. So now I got my black loaded and all I'm going to do is kind of Quickly paint the body of my spider. Now again at this point what you can do is you could throw in more detail at this point. Um, again today for time's sake uh, I won't be doing that but you could you know add a little bit of three dimension to the legs you know it, it all has to do with shading. Can you confirm the PSI you're using right now? I am shooting at 30 PSI. Now I am putting this paint on a little bit heavier and faster than I normally would. Again, due to uh, time constraints, I want to make sure that we can get through this entire image here. Uh, usually I'd be going a little bit slower, kind of, you know, building up the layers of paint. Um, As you're doing this, one of the things um, they can notice, you're, you're not wearing a mask, obviously, so that you can explain this as you go along. Mm -hmm. Would you normally wear a mask for doing this type of work? Um, it kind of, again, it kind of depends on the environment. Um, the only time I really make sure that I wear a mask is if I'm using any kind of solvent-based paint. Uh, with the water-based paint that I've been using, I, I really have never ran into any uh, issues or problems. Um, it certainly would not hurt, um, you know, again, to be able to to talk to everybody and to answer questions today, I wouldn't be able to. Um, under any normal circumstance, um, painting something like this, I, I would not. I mean, really, when you're talking airbrush, uh, it's not really that much overspray. I mean, you can, between um, Between the thickness of the paint and your air pressure, you should be able to dial in a, a, a pretty decent uh, consistency with your paint. Now you can tell that, like I said, because I'm going so fast and laying on paint so thick, it's getting kind of grainy here, um, which can't really avoid in this particular case. So now I pretty much got the body of the spider complete. 100% black. Um, at that point, I would call that body done. Um, so I can remove the frisket film at this time. Another alternative to frisket film is actually uh, contact paper, probably going to be uh, a little bit cheaper to use. Uh, same concept, same theory. Um, you can see through it, you can 
use any kind of uh, printout behind it and trace it. Um, so uh, here we are at this point. Our next step is going to be putting in these drop shadows. And I'm going to do that again relatively quick due to the fact that we are running out of time. So I'm going to... Yeah, we have about seven minutes. I am going to put this kind of up here and tape it on in case people have questions and want to connect with you. Okay. then just following the shadow lines on my reference picture I am just creating shadows now I'm not laying this paint on as heavy as I was when I did the initial black obviously as you can tell um, the reason is that this is a shadow so we don't want any real black dark shadows so Donna did say you could run over the hour <laughs> okay thank you Donna <laughs> So once I get my initial shadows on there, I look to see, you know, are they even? They actually don't look too, too bad. I'm going to go in and kind of smooth them out a little bit. <laughs> there is a question saying, is there any chance you will give away your creation? If somebody would like it, you can have it. Maybe we can go and post this, a picture of this out on your Facebook page later. People can comment and then we will send it off to somebody. Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, so this is where we are at at this stage. Uh, the entire uh, black body is uh, painted. I did do the drop shadow, uh, not as dark as the uh, body of the spider, obviously. Uh, the one step that we have uh, left is going to be the white highlights. And I'm going to clean the airbrush out real quick and spray some white and call this one complete. And I do appreciate everybody that has tuned in today to, to watch this. I hope that um, I was able to provide a, a tip or maybe something you were wondering about and I was able to answer that and, and, and it helps in, in your creating your artwork. So um, if anybody does uh, do a painting like this, uh, please, please, please uh, post it. I would love to see what you guys come up with. Again, um, it, there's so many directions you can take this that it just, it's, the, I'm at a loss for words here, but the, it's it's endless what you can do with with a subject like this, especially when you have a, a blank background. Um,
Donna did give me permission to um, go over the hour. So one thing I would like to do, I'm going to add a little bit of stippling to this background and I am going to use a what's called a stipple tip. Now uh, you can get that from Pro Air. What that does is that attaches to You're the... Have to bring it in more. It attaches to the, to the end of the airbrush and what that does then is it's going to provide a very fine stipple. And all I'm going to do is kind of randomly stipple through some of the areas here, maybe where it's a little bit darker. We'll give it a little bit more stippling. And that's just going to enhance our background a little bit. Uh, the one thing about stippling, I will say, especially with acrylic paints, is that because it did go on a little bit thicker, uh, just be aware that it's going to stay wet for a little while. Um, you wouldn't want to do that and then put your frisket film down or anything like that, you know, prior to it being dry. Can you repeat again, where do you get that stipple tip? The stipple tip, um, I got the three pack from Pro Air. Uh, so contact Donna if you um, are in need of them. They work wonderful. Um, I, I use them in body painting. I use them in uh, doing illustrations and um, they work absolutely wonderful. So our last color is white. And what I'm gonna do now is come in <coughs> and actually just do the white highlights pretty close to um, how the reference picture was. Where did the other reference go? Okay, earlier when I had mentioned the fact that I had printed out two full-size copies. Uh, one of the reasons was what I'm going to do is take this. This is the copy that I used to transfer the image. What I'm going to do now is if you, there's a white highlight here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut that out of this piece of paper. So you're going to use that to avoid the white getting anywhere else? I'm going to use that as like a temporary mask just so I can get this sharp edge and then fade my white out without having to worry about getting white over any of the other parts of it. So you can tell in our reference picture, you can see where there's a hard line here and then that white kind of fades off to the center of that abdomen piece. So by me cutting this out and having the reference picture at the size I needed, I was able to just cut that out of my print out there and then use that. So what I'll do is put that in position. Temporarily tack it into place. Now, there is just a little bit of white right in here, but you can see when I cut this out, it kind of gave me a little rough edge. Little rough edge on that paper. So I'm just going to go in and smooth it out. It doesn't have to be perfect. The, the highlight there is not very much. So again, I'm going to start on my paper here. 
Now what's going to happen, we, we did not put anything over the top of this already. So what's going to happen, when I paint this white on there, as the white dries, it's going to, what I call, drop. It's going to drop into the color that's underneath it. Um, you might possibly see this white kind of shift to a little bit of a blue tint. Uh, the reason for that is uh, there's so much blue in this black paint that when that white drops, it starts pulling the blue in. Uh, you may see it, you may not. You you may have even seen it on on you know anything that you're you've ever painted before. But that that is why that happens. So I just want to put in a small little sh shadow here. I'm not even painting on the actual canvas. I'm actually painting on the paper itself. And what that does, I don't know if you can see that or not. It gives a real light highlight right there now i want a stronger highlight up here so i am going to actually be spraying directly on the canvas and what i'm doing is i'm trying to as i move my airbrush i'm trying to stay in the same general shape i'm following the contour of the shape that i'm painting So as I put my first coat on, as it dries, like I said, it's going to drop or it's going to darken up a little bit. So I'll let that dry just a bit, but then I want to come in and build up that white just on this edge here. Okay, now what I'm going to do is you can see in the reference picture there's uh, the highlights on the legs. All I'm going to do is come in with the airbrush and work those. Anybody have any questions at this time? Uh, there's a question about how you finish when you are done with the image. Do you put a clear coat on? Um, you can. Um, there's nothing saying you, you have to. Uh, you certainly can. You could put a coat of uh, fixative on it, um, a matte finish, a gloss finish. You, you can certainly finish it off any way you'd like. Um, the one nice thing about Createx is that once it is dried, it will withstand any like lacquer-based clear coats or any type of automotive clear, um, which makes it ideal when you're doing, uh, if you're doing helmets or any kind of automotive work, uh, the, the um, Createx just works wonderful. I'm going to zoom in again on some of the effects that he's working on so you guys can see them. So I apologize if it's getting a little dizzying.
I apologize, everybody. I'm not a cameraman. I only play one on TV. One last step. Um, I'm liking the way that this looks. Uh, the only thing that I'm going to change is when I cut this circle out, it got a little bit whiter in that circle than I had hoped. So what I'm going to do, load up a little bit of black. I'm going to touch that area up, and I think we can, at that point, we should be able to call this one finished. So because we're over as he's reloading that black paint, I will probably just call for if there's any last questions that you want to ask while we're still um, finishing this up. So if you have any last, if you have any last um, questions, go ahead. I will say that at this point, for time purposes, he isn't completing all of the highlights on all of the legs that we'd be going on. Since we're over on time, um, he's just going through to make sure that you can see how the highlights go through and then going back over in the event that maybe some of your white got a little bit more than what you wanted. Paper to transfer this to the canvas. That's called frisket film. Do I have that right? The paper that I used is called graphite paper. Are you referring? Oh, graphite to the paper. I'm, I'm, Peggy. I'm going to your question here, and she's asking what was the paper called to transfer the image to canvas. So right. That is graphite paper. Correct. The frisket film is what you used to put over the traced image so that you could cut. A mask around that image. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. So transfer paper and then frisket film. So I think we can. I'm a little bit too close right now, and I apologize. <laughs> can you bring it a little bit closer? The finished product. There we go. And you can see some of the highlights, both the ones that he put on up there. And again, they're not quite finished. We were just. We've already gone over on time, so. But yeah, that is uh, typically how I would go through uh, doing an illustration. Again, um, this, this one was kind of compressed uh, down to about an hour. Uh, looks like we went about an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, typically something like this, I would probably spend at least uh, twice that. Um, you know, take my time, make sure everything is um, working great. The, you know, um, the, the lines are, are straight. Um, and again, uh, if you would like to see some of the other work uh, that I've done, uh, please feel free to visit my uh, either my Facebook page or my Instagram page, uh, both under Dave Gothier Art. Um, you can also go to davegothierart.com to see uh, some more work. Um, and again, if anybody out there that's that's uh, watching and is going to uh, paint something like this. I'd love to see what you guys come up with. Um, and I just wanted to take a quick minute to thank Donna for the opportunity uh, to be able to teach something like this. And, and I really hope 
um, at the end of all this that um, I was able to help at least one person with, you know, um, a lingering question they may have had. So um, I think with that, uh, we are going to call this one finished for now. And I just want to thank everybody who stopped by to watch. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you guys um, have an amazing rest of your day. So thank you very much.